Jules Engel, you were born in Budapest, Hungary, <laughs> and you're a teacher, yeah. a filmmaker, a painter, a sculptor, huh. a graphic artist, yeah. a mentor to young artists, and a set designer. That's good. That's yeah. good. That, <laughs> now that with takes about ten people. <laughs> when and why did you come to California? I think the reason because I was maybe going to join USC or UCLA as a track man, as an athlete. But then when I met this painter who had some other friends he knew in a little studio, next thing I know, he, he took me over there and uh, they hired me. Uh, what I had to do for him was at 6.30 in the morning, I would go over to his studio and make some drawings of black and white pen and ink drawings that he uh, follows, you know? Mm -hmm. What I didn't know that after I made those drawings for him, he put his name on them and he colored them. Well, that was just part of the, <laughs> I'm not gonna uh, do anything against that because he's getting me a job, you know. He, so every morning at 6.30 I went to the studio. I drew for about an hour and a half, two hours of pen and ink of the, the desert because that's what he was so good at. But he never told me that he signed them and sold them, of course. And so that was the beginning of uh, my stay in Los Angeles. Then I had friends at Disney, and they were telling over there about me because they saw my drawings. You mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. uh, so then uh, they saw my drawings, whatever, yeah. and they hired me at Disney. And what they hired me, that was Fantasia number one, you know? Yeah. I've, and they I've... hired me, uh, I don't know why, on this particular job, it's a bunch of mushrooms. They had the <laughs> mushrooms, they had the mushrooms in, in already, but no continuity, you see. And they hired me to to work that up into a continuity thing, which was a big hit. It, it ran for 59 seconds, you know. And there were the mushrooms by me, yeah. And, uh, and the problem was there that they couldn't see or understand that you can have these little shapes by themselves without the trees, without the bushes, without all this crap, you know? That was simple. I don't know if you remember that thing. It was a, it was a big hit, still is, because all you see are these little characters in the light, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and that they didn't want because it was so empty for them. Mm -hmm. But then when they saw what happened later, Everything was in good shape, but uh, the whole air, air experience there was a good one. It was a good one. What else did you work on at Disney? Did you oh, work on uh, Bambi? Bambi? Oh yeah, Bambi? did a lot of color stuff on Bambi. A lot of color stuff because I was known also as a color as a colorist. And on Bambi, I did I did, I did a board and all that, uh -huh. but color was a big factor because during the Fantasia, this man came in. He saw my color stuff. And he said, when I finish with what I'm working on, and I'm going on Bambi, then he would like to have me. What happened after your days at Disney? Uh, the, at Disney, went to the Air Force. Uh -huh. uh, with the war, you know, and all that stuff. Three, three and a half years, Air Force. And, uh, and that was, again, uh, well, I wanted to join, you know, but I had a problem. So I have a shoulder that used to pop out if you move that in a certain way. And the glasses, and they wouldn't take me. So, but I said to them, look, I, I just, I don't have to go, I'm not going any place, I'm not driving an aeroplane, but I, I will not be part of that, you see? Because we were downtown. By that time, this lady cleaning the floors and these two men in uniform, they finally said, okay, we'll take you, you know? <laughs> so, so I joined the, but they, but I already had something cooking because the Air Force knew I was gonna come in, and they had a film unit. So naturally, they were counting that I come in on a film unit. That doesn't. So you don't have to fly any place, but you're working on the on this unit which deals with films and all that. So that that's the way that worked out. Three and a half years. You founded an animation film studio. UPA. Yeah. It was something that uh, the, about three or four of us, we knew, of course, there was nothing for us after uh, this damn thing is over, 
but we managed, but there was one studio that was open for a bid. So we did a film and we got the job for Columbia to do about 24 or 16 films every year, you know. And then we took off because it really was the first time that in that art world, everything was kind of real, real or nothing. So came UP and we just blasted the whole place uh, from whole world. And people would come to UPA because things were done that's never been done in that in that medium before. This was really very, very special. Good art, good art, good color, good art that was strong. And you also came up with some very famous characters. Wasn't it? Uh, Gerald McBoing Boing. McBoing Boing. Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo. What, who was always one of my favorites, old yeah. Jim Backus, right? Yeah, Backus. When we, were, when we had a character drawn, then we needed a voice. So we had a lot of people came and tried. But, but when Backus came and he did the voice, the well, way he did it, we knew immediately we have a voice. We had a voice. And that was it. And then we just took off. But it is one of those wonderful things when it lasted like 12 or 14 years, you know, people were just coming and looking and we were on the top of the, of the whole motion picture industry, you know. And how long did the uh, studio live? Uh, well, I think we were there like 14 years, then we left and we opened, opened our own studio and uh, and that last, lasted another uh, four or five years. And then the whole damn industry fell apart. And uh, it looked like we're no jobs. But then something always happens. And we were bailed out. We were stuck with the studio because we owed so much rent. We had a two-story a two building, you know, and no job, nothing. And, uh, but we were lucky. Uh, some people wanted this building. Uh, Let's say if you own eighty thousand dollar, we own, you know. But we had no job, no work coming in. Come, these people come; they wanted to buy that building. That is what they want. Or they'll take over the whatever we own. Wow! <laughs> Imagine that. Whew. Well, it was some something, you know, because otherwise we would have been still paying the rent on that on that building. So that was the end of of UPA, United Production of America. But the good thing was that we changed the whole aspect what an animated film can be. I mean, changed. Even here, there are some of the students in other unit, uh, animation unit, the Disney unit, they still want to do UPA films. If they see things like Gerald McBoingo, Madeline, Frankie and Johnny, all that stuff, they want to do films like that. Yeah. That's very flattering for oh, yeah. you, I think. Yeah, it's good. The stuff was good and it's still good. If you do a film like Gerald, Big Boing Boing, yeah. it is such a well done film that you almost don't want to do another one. Now what happened from Columbia said that we want some more. So we did three more and they were, you know, the stuff wasn't there. The first one was good. It had the content, the story, whatever it was. It was good. The others, after three or four, people had it more or less, you know. But we were still in business, you know. We were not relying on that. We still had 10 years to go, and we did go. And we did a lot of other stuff there. And Columbia took the, looked at the pictures, and they put it on the shelf. Because it wasn't the typical cartoon that they get from Warner Brothers or MGM. And, and they didn't like what we did. So finally they told us, don't do that anymore, just do Gerald, you know. Well, if you're only going to do Gerald, you're, that's just like, like doing that to you, you know. But uh, you, the public will take it, you know, but the, but the office at the uh, big studios, people who sell the, uh, the film to the, to the, to the uh, movie house, you know, they couldn't sell them because that was too, we were too far out for, for all those people, too far out. But, uh, but we did it. I mean, we did it. Well, you've been far out your whole life, really. 
Yeah, but nicely, nicely, <laughs> nicely. <laughs> Absolutely. What I mean is, by that I mean it's without, uh, you know, blasting away and making a big deal and stuff like that. No, you, you don't do that. Have you always worked in animation? Or have you worked in, what, documentaries and features or has Well, yeah, I've worked on all, anything, anything, a lot of stuff like anything that. Anything that moves. Anything that moves is right. And also did a lot of titles. Do you think that animation will ever go out of style? I, I really don't think so. In fact, it's, it's getting bigger because now what comes out of Asia, you know, that's big, that's huge. So, so that means <laughs> more and more, you know. Hmm. But I think, I think it's a medium that does well, does well. But it, it also has highs and lows where nothing looks good and not other time, you know, things pick up and something comes along and it That's a smash. explodes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a smash, yeah. but it's an up and down. You've trained many successful yeah. graduates yeah. from CalArts. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've always wondered. Can creativity be taught or is one born with it? That's a good question. That's a good question. You have to have something going for you from the very beginning. It's just, it's just there. Uh, the, other, the other end of it, you have a lot of people who are so desperate, they want to do it, they want that they work at it, they work at it, eventually they become good at it, you see? Only good. Only good. Not brilliant. No, not quite. But, but then again, there's a couple of people who I would not consider truly talented and natural, but they have done well because they so desperately want to make it, and, and they make it, you know. And then you have a lot of people who, who has all the tools, but he's missing something which will take another six or eight years before he really can make that thing shiny, like the rest of the pieces are. Some of these people surprise you what they do 10 years later, you know. So you can't tell. I think it's so, so wrong mm -hmm. to expect uh, everything from a student. No, don't, don't expect. Because you don't know when the damn thing just explodes. As long as you don't get too heavy with your, oh, this is, you know. See, this thing behind me, I just did the day before yesterday, and it's, it's good. Then I'm surprised, you know, because I was working on something else when this bunch of stuff on my desk got to the point where I was going to get it off. And when I did that, oh my God, I could have never done it, you mm -hmm. know. Next thing I know, it's the, ta the tape, and I tape everything down, and it's a beauty. Are your paintings, drawings, prints, uh, do you consider those sketches for animated films, or it's a totally separate no, it's a two, a two other world. No, animation is something yeah. else. Who are your favorite artists? It's not a bad question. Cezanne. I simply like his landscapes, you know. There are many others, but there's something about his landscapes that is just a damn, hmm. damn good, you know. And then the closer you get, the more it's just not nothing, you know. Uh, Nothing, nothing. You have to get back before the damn thing, you know, come, becomes a shape or, or whatever. I like Cezanne, I, 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 re I really do. But I also like Kandinsky, you know, but that's, a, that's another branch, you know. But uh, I, like, I like Kandinsky. And I got to know him very early, you know. As a, but I'm also a great fan of the ballet Who's the Monte Carlo. When people move, it's yeah. nothing more beautiful. When you see a 220 man running around a curve, you know, and you're in the right spot and you see that incredible talent, yeah. that body, it's, not, it's, it's beautiful, that's magic, you know, it's magic. Also, you have to have a, your eyes open. This thing here, there was this and this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on a pile of paper. Just a, just a pile of paper, junk, you know? And I looked at it and I said, can I have that? Yeah. So then I put these three pieces together 
And it works. And it works. Yeah. You, you see? Absolutely. But when I saw this and that, yeah. you know, on the floor, he was throwing the yeah. stuff out, you know. I got to, I said, can I have this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but <laughs> but sometimes, you, either you see or you don't see, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. A, no, that's what you, you mean when you say you, you're, you have to be open. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be an icon? I am? Yeah, you're an icon. I have no idea of that. No. Only fairly recently things began to gather momentum. Mm. I, I, I know they were showing some work of mine in Spain. I know they wanted me in Italy. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other things going on and it's also sort of hovers around you and I think it's a, it's a question of time when that, when that happens, you know. But I don't, I don't have that feeling that you just mentioned. I, I really, I really don't. And uh, I never felt like that. Maybe I'm a little bit, uh, what's the word, pleased that things happen, you, you know. Uh, even the fact that you hear you sermon, that's special. But I, I don't somehow carry any kind of weight like that on my back.